So we just had, I just arrived today, so uh, I don't know how the talks have been in the morning, so I hope that they were extremely good and also yesterday. But I just want to start by thanking very much Darius for the invitation. It's actually a very nice, perfect organization and also G2. Promised G2 many years to come here and this is my first time in India, so I'm really enjoying it. So um, what um, Darius actually asked me was to give a more like introductory talk or a talk about the tools that we are using in our lab. So um, I hope I won't saturate you out of information, but um, essentially, um, you know, I work in the Institute of Photonic Sciences, and so my background is in physics, and actually what we do in our lab is essentially photonics, so things in optics. And we're trying to develop um, instruments, uh, uh, my microscopes, that they could be applied to uh, biological studies. And one part of my group actually focuses on the study of biologically relevant problems um, using the techniques that we developed in-house. So uh, what I'm going to try to tell you in the, in the hour or so is the combination of these optical nanotools that we developed in the lab in combination with uh, mechanical manipulation techniques, which I guess that by now you even know much more than myself about it, because this is a new field also for us, and we are very much interested in uh, subcellular studies. So let me just um, start by, by giving you a little bit of a background or motivation from the biological point of view, what is that that is driving us, um, our research. So as you uh, very well known, um, one of the key properties of cell membranes and actually of living cells is uh, compartment. Size both in time and in space. And this actually, this lateral organization is very much related to function. So I'm not talking only about organization and recruitment and clustering of little uh, protein receptors or lipids, but also the interaction with the, proximity, the proximity, proximal um, actin cytoskeleton and the formation of signaling nanoplatforms on the cell membrane. Signaling, as you well know, starts at the level of the cell membrane, and we're actually interested in mapping and visualizing, trying to build up and see all the building up of these uh, platforms as they come into the soil surface. Now, since uh, you probably know this uh, lateral organization is actually not something that is stable in time, it's something that varies, that is transient, so there is dynamics involved in that, and also the organization occurs at the nanometer scale. So we need to come up with techniques that are able to allow us to look at the cell membrane at the nanometer level and with sufficient time resolution, and this is actually one of the major goals in our, in our lab. So what type of components are we interested in and what are the type of components that essentially regulate the compartmentalization of the cell membrane? And, and this is actually taken from a uh, um, review article from Akira Kusumi, in which you have different players in here um, that help to organize the cell membrane. You have a templating of the cell membrane by the cytoskeleton. You also have lipids, specific lipids in the cell membrane that favor interaction between different components. And you also have uh, proteins and self-clustering of different type of proteins. And that upon activation, they will trigger a specific signal in India. So uh, one of the things that we're very much interested in is actually to touch with our techniques this different levels and trying to elucidate what is the relevance of these different components at a which uh, spatial and temporal scale. Now, um, one of the things and one of the hypotheses that we are working at the moment and that we became very intrigued about is that, well, is the cell membrane organization also influenced by mechanical stimuli? And this is what our interest in mechanics or in, in, in cell mechanics or in mechanobiology comes about. And actually, all these components that I told you just before, the plasma membrane, these lipid nanodomains or this clustering of a small protein as well as signaling molecules as well as the actin, they in principle should be also sensitive to forces. So now, since the organization of these guys have a very important role in the function or in cellular function, therefore mechanical stimuli 
by rearranging the things around should also have an impact in cell function. And actually a very uh, a clear example of the importance of forces um, that actually our group is, is, is working on is in, in the context of the immune response. And this is essentially a cartoon taken from the uh, website of Ronan Allen, which you can see in here how the process of a fettering, rolling, activation, and arrest, and actually extravasation of monocyte occurred in the blood vessels. So what you see in here is a process in which monocyte actually they go at a very high um, and speed under the presence of a shear flow in here, and then upon uh, triggering by chemokines from the endothelium, these um, uh, monocytes, there are molecules on the cell surface of the monocytes that they become activated, and that essentially make that then all of a sudden these monocytes, they start rolled, they rolling, they arrest, and until at a given moment, they essentially extravasate and they go to the places of uh, inflammation. And if you look at it in this interface between monocytes and the endothelial, you will see that there is a whole bunch of molecules in the, both on the size of the endothelium as well on, on the size of the monocyte that they do have to become activated. They do have to become uh, uh, interacting with inner proteins in here and with the acting cytoskeleton. And everything in here occurs at the level of the cell membrane in which you also have actual forces in here between the endothelial part and the uh, integrin receptors on this side, so we have forces along this direction, but we have also shear forces in that. And so we essentially predict, and this is what we're interested in, how we can get a handle of what is happening in here when we apply forces to our system. Now, so what are the sort of um, approaches that we're using in our lab? Um, and, and you have been seeing many of these approaches already in here. So uh, we have created, so we're actually developing these essentially three main tools um, in our lab in order to apply mechanical forces. One of them is a, um, a fluid device in which we are able to apply shear flow in this range, which is the physiological range. And, uh, and on monocytes, um, just seated on, uh, on endothelial cells. So this is our shear flow device. And we also have a stretching system in here which essentially we applied isotropic stretching to the cells, and then we also um, have the possibility of making uh, micro patterns, both with chemical as well as top uh, topological contrast in that. Now, so we are developing these tools in our lab, and, and of course, these are the way that we are using in order to apply forces, but then, of course, we have the other set, which is extremely important, which is the optical tools that we have in order to visualize what is going on in that. Now, the problem uh, that, that um, most of us have is that when you want to look at these interactions, and remember that I told you that we want to look at the cell membrane, we want to look at that with high temporal resolution because these processes occur in living cells and they're transient, as I told you, and we want to reach the nanometer scale. So now the challenge is in here, the, 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 the question that a standard optical microscopy is not good enough to actually look at that nanometer scale organization because it simply lacks the resolution and the sensitivity. And when I talk about resolution, it's because we are limited by diffraction when I talk about sensitivity, it's because we want to be able to uh, follow individual molecules. So we need to have the sensitivity for single molecule detection. So a large part of research in our group is essentially uh, focused on this part in here. And the talk that I'm going to give you today is essentially focused on strategies that I go along, along this direction. And I won't talk too much about this because anyway, there will be a conference in a couple of days and I will probably go into a little bit more detail in here. And there will be also two other talks from two postdocs in my group, Thomas and Isabella, which will actually show some of the results that we have been getting in here. So I will just focus on to this uh, part, most of the talk. So now, so what is the problem with optical microscopy? And probably most of you are already aware of it 
is the, uh, the, the diffraction limit of light that essentially doesn't allow you to see structures that are smaller than, um, let's say, three to 400 nanometers. And so if you take an image, a very nice image of a, a cells in here, you can label many of these components in there. So when you try to zoom in into the structures and you try to increase your resolution, you start seeing that the things are essentially blurring out. And if you try to zoom in, in on the scale of what we would like to see, nanometer scale compartment, as you can see in here, the image is completely blurred. And the image is completely blurred because of the diffraction limit. So um, in our lab, what we're doing is essentially coming up with technique. So everything that is from this line to the left is essentially the sizes that one can reach with a standard optical microscopy. The diffraction limit will be around here. And essentially what we do is that we develop this series of palette of techniques. We provide us um, higher spatial resolution. So we develop this technique, which I will explain to you in a little while, but we also use in another technique, super resolution technique instead. And, and these techniques are essentially slow. So at one level, we can actually increase our resolution to the level of the nanometri nanometric range, but we also want to combine that with techniques that give us the higher temporal resolution. And in order to go to a higher temporal resolution, we are using single particle tracking techniques, so multicolor single particle tracking. These are techniques that are very well standard nowadays, but I will just show you a, a couple of slides in this. And more exciting is our recent developments on the use of antenna geometries in combination with fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, which allowed us to work in the microsecond regime and to actually go to the nanometer scale. So um, let me just go back to this diffraction limit of light for just to remind uh, all of you what the problem is about. And the problem essentially comes, so when you have a, a point source in a microscope, you essentially need a lens in order to collect the light. But if you want to, you're not able essentially to collect with the lens the full spectrum of the light because you have both near and far field components that essentially compose the whole angular spectrum of your information. And essentially you have um, isotropic emission from these point, stars, point source uh, uh, point in here, which and only a partially of that is being collected by the lens. Now as a result of that, when you have a point source and you use a lens in here, what you get at the end is an airy pattern of what people also talk like the point spread function. And that point spread function is essentially this one, which is going to give you the effective resolution that you're going to have into your system. Now, defined in a different way, there is this Riley criteria, which essentially tells us the same thing. So if you have an object, and this object, um, you essentially um, looked at the object, you're going to have a finite, band, uh, a finite width on the, on the spot, on the point spread function that you have in there. You can actually put these two, uh, two objects very close to each other, and if you approach them closer than the diffraction of limit of light, you would not be able to recognize them as individual features. And essentially, this uh, Raleigh criteria is, is given by these um, equations in here, and it's essentially given by the wavelength of the light that you're using divided by the NA of the objective. So even if you use the highest NA objective that exists nowadays, and, and nowadays you can go to 1.5 or even 1.6 NA objective, you still have to come up with this relationship in here, and lambda is the wavelength, wavelength of light. So if you work in the red uh, 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 wavelength, for instance, 633 nanometers, in practice, and with all the geometrical part of your setup, you're going to be limited uh, to this rate in there. Now, nowadays, and probably many of you know, that um, in the last years, the diffraction limit of light has been overcome by using different techniques. And this is a new field of research called super-resolution nanoscopy. I just want to give you a, a, a very short sort of overview of the difference in here. There are essentially two ways in which you can uh, uh, overcome the diffraction limit of light. One of them is just using conventional optics like any microscope, but essentially you need to combine that uh, setup 
with the use of fluorescent molecules. So it's a technique that is very dependent on the fluorescent molecules that you put into that, and therefore you need to control very well the photophysics of the fluorophores in order to get the super resolution in here. But it's a technique that is advancing extremely fast, and it has many different types of approaches in order to get super resolution. So I won't go into this part so much because the, the, there are many experts in the field which are working in here. On the other hand, there is this other way of getting uh, a super resolution, which essentially is getting rid of the lenses. You remember that in the previous slide, I told you that essentially what is limiting is the way that you collect the light because you use these lenses. If you get rid of the lenses and you try to actually collect the near field contribution of your sample, that near field contribution is going to have the high frequency components which they belong to the fine details of your sample. So the way of doing that is really working on the near field and it's essentially making use of the field of near field optics. So now, why it is interesting for us and for our group to work with near field is essentially because this technique, aside from the fact that it does break the diffraction limit of light, is an ideal technique to address the cell membrane and the proximity of the cell membrane, and I will tell you why in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. So rather than using, and we're using quite a lot of these techniques in our lab, so we have commercially available setups in there, we, when we have a specific problems in which we want to address the cell membrane, we essentially uh, work with near field optics. So uh, what is the principle of near field optics? Essentially, this technique was suggested already many years ago, so it was arrested by Singer in, in 1928. And actually Singer at that time sent a paper to um, Albert Einstein with the idea of near field optics and Albert Einstein came back to him telling him that he was crazy, that that thing would never work. And actually, Albert, so the paper got rejected, by the way. That happened to still at that time. So he actually, I don't think that he even submitted the paper, so he wrote it down. Um, and, and actually, it was not feasible at the time because the technology was not there, right? So what is the principle of near field optics? Essentially, what you have in far field, I said that already, so when you have far field diffraction uh, 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 um, optics, Essentially, your point spread function is essentially giving you by this relation that I told you before. So it's lambda over 2 Na. So it's essentially about lambda over 2 in here. And you cannot squeeze that anymore using conventional optics. Now, what Sinji proposed, he would say, well, I mean, one of the ways to get around this is to essentially use, if you use an opaque metallic um, layer in here, and you can make a very small hole in there, all the light would not be able to pass, and only a small amount of light would be able to pass through this very small aperture in there. And actually, the amount of light and the components of the light that would come in here are what are called near-field components. In other words, when you have a wave of light that comes in here, the light essentially propagates, but it propagates until the dimensions that you give to the light to propagate, if you start reducing uh, the dimensions in which light can propagate, light would not propagate anymore. So you're not talking about a propagating wave anymore, but you still have the near field components which are evanescent in character, which you can still collect. And so the idea of this is that you have near field components in there, which would, you would then transform into far field using an objective and you would detect it in there. And now the resolution that you will have in here is going to be essentially limited by the size, or essentially given by the size of this small hole that you make in there. Now, in practical terms, the, the technique is sort of being implemented by using sub-wavelength aperture probes. So these are glass fibers, which one tapered and covered with aluminum in order to screen and keep the light inside the fiber. And one is able to make a very small hole here in the, mid, in the, in the center of this fiber. And in our case, we work with tips that are in the order of uh, 50 to 100 nanometers. And then the other criteria that you need to do is that you have this needle because the components and the light that comes out from here has an evanescent character. And so it's in the near field 
you need to put your tip in very close proximity to the sample. So this is the trick that requires this technique. Having a very small hole in here and having your sample in very close proximity to the sample. Now, and this is how the schematics of the setup looks like. So essentially, uh, um, you have uh, your samples in here. The sample is being placed on top of the scanners because you will put this tip in here, and if you want to generate an image, you either have to scan the tip on the sample or you need to scan the sample on the tip, all right, so that you generate an image. And then you use this sub-wavelength probe in here. You have to bring this tip very close to the samples in there. And so essentially what you're going to do is that you're going to illuminate very locally your sample with a diameter of about 70 nanometers. The light would interact with the sample and then it's being converted into a far fill that is being detected by this high NA objective and then it's being sent to the detectors in there. Now, how close, and you can see in here a zoom in of the probes that we use in there. So what you see in here is the glass aperture. So in this particular case, it's a 70 nanometers aperture in there. You have the metal surrounding this aperture. And so the light is being brought from above in here, and it just exits this probe in there. Now, this tip actually has to be placed, as I said, very close to the sample. And when I mean close, I mean within 10 nanometers from your sample surface. And the way to actually keep it so that you don't crush the tip with the sample and that the tip can actually follow the topography of your sample as you're making an image is essentially using our um, additional sensor, which is called a shear force sensor in here. It's essentially a tuning fork. So in the way that it works, this technique, you have your tip, you have your sample, and you attach the tip to this tuning fork. You start oscillating with a very small amplitude this tip as you start coming closer to the sun. Now you oscillate this tip with an amplitude, a very small amplitude, and what you are detecting on the other side is a change on that amplitude. And as the tip comes closer to the sample, it starts sensing forces of interaction between the sample and the tip. And then you engage a feedback loop so that the tip doesn't crash into the sample. So from that point of view, it's very similar to atomic force microscopy, which I don't know whether some of you might be familiar with. So now after you essentially engage the tip, then you start doing your scanning. Now, one of the things that uh, we do in the lab is that we have made a system which allows us to work under liquid conditions, and so we work in the cellular context, so by keeping the cells in completely physiological conditions in here. And so one of the um, um, av advantages of the technique, well, one of the advantages, let me tell you something, and to start with, this technique is extremely complicated to work and to operate, and actually there was a major boom in the 90s of everybody going into this technique. And, uh, and essentially for biological applications, most of people essentially gave up on the technique. And now with the advent of this other super resolution technique, which is much easier to implement, there are very few groups in the world using the technique. Yes? The, 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 the yes. No, we, we image the upper part of the cell membrane, right? So we essentially are uh, confined and restricted to the upper part of the cell membrane, indeed. Yes, yeah. So it is an ad it's a disadvantage of the technique to start with, apart from the practical complications of the technique, it's a disadvantage in, from the point of view that you don't have access to intracellular compartment or even to the bottom membrane, which might be interested in many cases. On the other hand, you are extremely sensitive to the membrane in here, and essentially the, the light, and, and, and this is actually put up in here, we have a, an extremely high sensitivity into the Z direction. So we're not only able to um, detect with very high sensitivity the cell membrane, but what it is immediately underneath. And I'm thinking in here, 
um, exclusively in terms of cytosolic proteins that are being brought up up and signaling or interactions with the cortical cytoskeleton that you get completely blurred out by the whole labeling of the rest of the molecules in there. So we have this specific sensitivity from that, which in our case is extremely of an extreme advantage. So that's, that, that's essentially one of the main reasons why we use the technique in this context. Right, right, right. So that, that will be different. So we won't combine the shear flow. We won't combine the shear. F I, I will tell you what, at, at the end, what, what is that that we're trying to do well, in combination with the shear flow, okay? Now, uh, so, so, so this is essentially the, probably the most important part uh, that I wanted to say in the context of this talk in here. Um, the, the, probably the other thing that is very interesting is that because you can essentially put any wavelength of the light through this probe, and then at the end of the day, you're going to funnel this probe into, a, into you're going to funnel the light into this sub-wavelength aperture. You don't suffer from chromatic aberrations, and you can put any wavelength that you want to put in there. So now, for those of you that have heard or have used super-resolution techniques, whatever is that, um, or palm, um, you know that it's tricky to combine different wavelengths and having multicolors, especially in the case of the STET, is quite tricky. In, in the particular case of this technique, we don't have that limitation, and we get equal resolution into whatever wavelength that we use because the resolution is given essentially by this aperture in that. Now, it has a major disadvantage, this technique, in the, in the way that it is, apart from the technical and the fragility of these probes, and it's the fact that you have to scan, so it's a slow technique. So how do we use, when we make imaging of um, ENSOM, when we want to make um, uh, super resolution images, is that we work with fixed cells. So we try it and we have developed protocols in order to fix the cell membrane without altering the organization. Actually, Thomas is an expert doing that. And, um, but, but we work with fixed cells, okay, so that we don't have dynamics going on in there. And I will tell you a little bit later on how are we using this technique in order to get dynamic information, which is in a slightly different approach. Okay, so, so what do we get or what do we see? And this is only a few examples of work that we have published already a couple of years ago so that you see a little bit of the idea of the technique. So um, in here what you see in that, so this is, these are um, um, monocytes which they have been labeled with um, cholera rotoxin. So in here we are specifically labeling a lipid on the cell membrane. If you go up in here, you will see that the amount of uh, signal that we get in here is overwhelming. And of course, if we look at this in confocal, we don't get enough resolution to discriminate any type of nano compartment in that. If we zoom in with confocal, this is essentially what you see, your blurry signal. If we then switch our way of exciting, from going to the confocal and going into the near field via the probe, then we start seeing much more details in that. And actually, we are able to discriminate individual nanoclusters of this GPR, uh, of this uh, uh, GM1 uh, cholera rotoxin nanoclusters in that. Now, um, the technique, and this is also something that is different from other super resolution techniques, is that because what you get is essentially fluorescence from your marker without having to use the physical properties of the marker in there, you have all the full information to do quantitative analysis. And we have single molecule detection sensitivity so that then we can know if we are detecting one spot, if that spot corresponds to the emission of one individual molecule or multiple molecules. So we can reveal the stoichiometry of our system directly with this technique. And this is essentially an example of GPI anchor proteins, which they have been labeled also using um, 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 uh, Thomas, how is that again? The, say it again? Flare, right, flare. Right, so um, you have the confocal in here. When we switch from confocal to ensemble, you see all these little spots in there. What we're doing here in terms, in, in order to quantify the data, is actually measuring how much is the intensity of each individual spot in there. And so this is the distribution of intensity of all the spots that recovered from different uh, images in there. And we essentially see that the distribution has a tail in there. We also take the distribution from individual flare molecules on the glass surface, and that serves to us as the 
control the calibration from single molecule detection. And then if we do this, we can actually derive the stoichiometry and the percentage of monomers, dimers, and trimers that we have on our sample. So in that way, we can get a stoichiometry on these little nanoclusters of the um, GPI anchor protein. Now, one of the things that we know, of course, when you have all the raw data is that you can separate spots that, that belong to monomeric GPIs from those spots that correspond to dimers, trimers, or even tetramers in there. And then we can see how is the relative spatial organization of monomers between themselves and of these little nanoclusters. So this is work that we already published about four years ago by now, but I think it's very nice because it gives you also the, the potential of the technique. If we look in here at the distances between individual monomers of the GPI anchor proteins, and then you get this distribution here on these bars, and then you overlap that with the distribution of a simulation that you do with random organization of the spots, you essentially see that the distributions overlap very well with each other, which is essentially telling you that the monomers of these GPI anchor proteins are essentially distributed in a random fashion. If you do exactly the same thing, but now you look at the distances between um, uh, the oligomers of the GPI anchor protein and you uh, contrast that with simulations of random organization, you see that it significantly deviates from random. And what this is telling you is that there is a sort of another scale of organization of these GPI anchored uh, uh, proteins, oligomers, on the cell surface. So these oligomers not only, or these GPIs, do not only form oligomers on the cell surface, but those oligomers are spaced by a distance of about 250 nanometers or so, which is something that we essentially call this hotspot, and you can see in here some of the examples. So these are the images that we just project projected in the Z direction, when you see this particular enrichment of GBI anchor protein. Yes? So, uh, in the Z direction, Yes. Now, uh, say something like this must be very sure that for each molecule, at the same distance from the tip. Yes. What resolution can you, what is the resolution of being close to the membrane? Um, yes, 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 yes. So we have, you, you will see it in a little while well in a different context, but let me just answer your question. We have this feedback loop that, that keeps in there. And so the vertical noise that we have, and in other words, how much is the variation from the cell membrane is below one nanometer. So and we are really stable in time. So that, so, so that if, if the tip, so what we do is that when we do our scanning, we do our own scanning on, a, on, a, on a, a fixed height in there. So when the cell goes down or there are fluctuations, we essentially keep the same distance. Now the distance that we keep is in the order of 10 nanometers, but it's 10 nanometers plus minus one nanometer. And this is the control that we have, okay? No, no. I mean, we, we, are, we are able to, uh, we are able to follow, so either as when, when we do, and I will show that later, so on the FCS, that we really work with living cells. So fluctuations of the membrane, the tip just retracts and it follows that, so that we keep that. And this is actually very important. We see that on the intensities. I will, sh I will show you this, so, so that you will see it immediately, because it becomes very apparent from the, from the data. <laughs> Right, so the frequency, so for this type of images in here, so we have the bandwidth of our feedback is uh, below one kilohertz. So in, in, in practice, actually, we are, we are scanning very slowly. Okay, so, 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 we do, so when we do the imaging, actually, the, the, I, I guess that the bandwidth, it will be about 700 hertz, which is essentially restricted into the, um, you know, the scanning speed that we can reach. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so. Around 10 nanometers, and if you hold the tip around 10 nanometers from the membrane, mm -hmm. is it, then would it be possible to use to take it, keep something in a particular space coming? Like oh, yeah. oh, yes, yes, this is actually what we want to do, Suvra. Yeah, indeed. I mean, we, we, we really hope to be able to see the arrival of these things when they are within, 
um, I've, I've, uh, let me just jump. So lapsus in here, and, uh, and I think I need this, so you will see essentially because it would come into right. So, so, so this is how we do. So this is how we do FCS now. So now is how we gather uh, dynamic information. So in in this it, now. Uh, since the cell is, al is alive, right, and, and our technique is slow, we don't scan. We just position our tip on top of the sample and we let the molecules to diffuse in a conventional FCS approach. And so we let the molecules to diffuse and we put this stationary in some probe in that. So now this is a real measurement, Subra, of the, uh, the tip sample distance, right? So the distance between the, the, the tip and the samples in there and the decaying of the evanescent field that it goes in there, all right? So, so, so this is a measurement in there and you can see that we are extremely sensitive within the 100 nanometers in there. So anything that will arrive or that it will deviate from these 100 nanometers, we will see it immediately leaving or coming or arriving in there. So how sharp is this measurement? And to answer to your question is to how um, accurate are we in here? So this is as a function of time, and this is the error signal, which tells you how accurate we are. And you can see in here, this is essentially one nanometer of the, of the precision that we have in there. OK? So now I go back. Yes. Oh. So maybe Oh dearie. All right, okay. I'll do this. So let me just uh let me just skip this one. And I just and, and I just go into the time domain now, which is essentially going into this uh let me just um Going to here because I think that this is interesting. So this is this technique, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, in which essentially what you do is that you collect the fluctuations of the molecules as these molecules traverse the illumination volume in there. So this technique is widely used by many people because it's extremely easy. When you get the data from these fluctuations in there and you get your autocorrelation function, essentially there are two pieces of information which are extremely important. One of them it's actually the C00 value would tell you the number one over the number of molecules that they are passing by. So it also provides information about the stoichiometry and the sizes of the complexes and the diffusion time. Also that it tell you what type of diffusion. Now the problem with the conventional confocal FCS is again the diffraction and in our particular case is the depth of the beam that you have in the set direction. So for this, we're essentially using our ensemble approach which um, I already explained this slide so that you have an idea of how we implement it. And we have been able to then record the diffusion of different lipids on living cell membranes as we go from confocal and we start reducing the illumination volume using different tips. So going from 180 nanometers aperture down to about 100 nanometers aperture. And then if you plot in here, your, uh, the transient times in that as a function of your illumination area, you recover it in here on a straight line, which for this particular lipid P is Brownian. So you would expect to have indeed a straight line in that. Now, we looked also with this technique at the sphingomyelin. And when you use sphingomyelin and you start reducing your illumination volume, so now your um, autocorrelation function does not really follow a linear relationship, but you start seeing this anomalous diffusion, which is essentially the result of reducing your illumination volume to sizes that they are comparable to the, uh, to the nanoheterogeneities that we see in there. Now, we had a bottleneck using these uh, sub-wavelength probes because it's, it's actually very difficult to reduce even further the illumination volume and still have enough light to illuminate the sample. So in that is when the second part, and this is current research in our group, we started to go for a different field, which is called photonic antennas, which are nanostructures that essentially allowed you to burst the electromagnetic field while reducing the volume of illumination. And since I don't have much time, I just want to show you in practice what these things is. So instead of having these sub-wavelength probes that I told you before, what we do is now we engineer these probes 
to make these antennas. So this is a bow tie antenna, and we make them at the very end of these end-tone probes. And so essentially, we can see difference. We have quite a lot of reproducibility, and they work very nice in there. And the advantage of using this is that now the light is going to be squeezed in these dimensions in there. It's not going to be only squeezed to dimensions of about 50 nanometers, but also the electromagnetic field is going to be much higher. And I won't show you the simulations, but you can see in here probably this is the result of the simulation in which we can amplify the field by a factor of 35 when we excite this antenna. So we have this spot essentially in here with an amplitude which is 35 times larger plus another trick that I cannot explain to you now, in which we have a very large uh, enhancement. And let me just go to the results that Thomas in his talk, he would uh, expand on this. But now we are able to uh, really have enough intensity using these antennas and being able to record with much higher uh, temporal resolution the diffusion of components on the cell surface. So we're using this uh, technique in that. So the field of the antennas is something that, that, uh, that we're pursuing a lot. Um, the other thing that we're actually doing, and this is starts to connect more with the fact that we're going to have these mechanical stimulation devices, is to make these antenna uh, geometries also in a two-dimensional place. So making glass substrate in which we have these little antennas, and now we have a very strong electromagnetic field confined into these little dimensions of the antennas. So we have been using this concept, and hopefully Thomas will receive these substrates to actually do experiment here in the group of Gito with Subrayit, in which we essentially would put living cells in here on top of these antennas and having this hot spot of illumination with dimensions that are able to go between 50 nanometers, hopefully 30 nanometers to about 100 nanometers, and then being able to have very local excitation of uh, cell membrane components. So one of the ideas of Thomas coming up in here is to combine with Suvra and start using these antennas to get uh, information in there. Um, we are actually working, and these are the type of structures that, that Thomas would hopefully get. So these are two-dimensional arrays of bow tie antennas. Um, these are dimer antennas, and it's also getting circular um, apertures in there. And this is together with a collaboration that we're having with a group of the EPFL. So um, they're actually able to make these in, in substrates which are about one millimeter and one millimeter size so that we can put different uh, cells in there and start exploring um, uh, this organization in a dynamic fashion. How many more minutes? Darius, I've run out of uh, time already. Okay, okay. Mm, I will probably skip this one. And I will just, let me just go to the, the final three slides. So, <coughs> so this is what a little bit very fast in terms of the <coughs> technique that we're using. Now, what we're trying to use in the lab, and we have succeeded already in some of the cases, is actually combining these approaches, and not only the ones that I told you, but also single particle tracking, to in combination with different methods of mechanical stimulation. So one of the, the, the parts that we have been working on this already for quite some time is to make micro-pattern micro substrates so that we can confine um, a specific ligands um, especially on the cell surface, and then see accumulation and trying to build up uh, the recruitment of receptors and signaling using this microcontact printing, which I guess it has been described already in here several times. So we can put different ligands in here. We can make it with different geometries and spacing. Using this PDMS stamp, we can actually go down to about one micron. Below one micron, we start losing uh, uh, sensitivity and start losing fidelity on this chemical contrast. <coughs> we also using topographic contrast in here by using, so we use this uh, technique of autoembosing. This is in collaboration with a group in Barcelona so that we use different polymers like polyesterate and PMMA and then we do this hot embossing so that we can have large substrates in there again, of different sizes, geometries, and what it is also important of different heights. So what we can see is that cells are extremely sensitive to height difference, which are even below 100 nanometers. So we can make these uh, topographies 
from going from one uh, 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 um, hundred nanometers up to one micron and then see the differences in that. So of course the idea is that we use this to see the cells in there and then we mount this into our single molecule setup so that we can look at the dynamics. Now the other thing that we are actually using and so we took this from Chavi Trepat which I think that Chavi is going to be uh, coming in here also to this meeting. And um, so we use this uh, stretching apparatus. So we um, have it set it up in, uh, in, in our single molecule setup, in which you have these PDMS stamps, which uh, are about 100 micron thick. We functionalize it with a specific ligand, and then we uh, essentially stretch the substrate under our single molecule setup. And so uh, we can apply different sorts of stretch. The results that we get are very difficult to interpret, and we're seeing many things that we did not anticipate, and so that's why I didn't want to spend much time talking in here. But one of the first things that we saw is that if you apply the stretch, on monocytes, you really see a change of the phenotype, and actually monocytes, they start becoming polarized and developing a sort of a more migratory type of uh, response in there. We are able to, yes, yes. So we have, in, in this case, we have done it with the storm, and we're doing single particle tracking with, with, uh, with this, on these PDMS stamps, yeah. During the, yes, so during the stretching, we do the single particle tracking. We essentially stretch, we fix, and we do a storm in this particular case because for the storm, we need to go and fix. Right, so, so essentially, uh, the approaches that we're doing, and this is now goes to your question, is that in some of the cases, what we're doing is that we apply either the stretch or Isabella, which she would talk on her talk, shear flow. So she does the shear flow experiment, she fix immediately, and then we take that to the setup. So at the moment, there are some of the stuff that we can do on the living cell, which is like, for instance, single particle tracking, we can do it. In other cases, we do it, then we fix, and then we look. Okay? So, um, and so this is the uh, flow device, the shear flow device, which is, again, compatible with single particle tracking that Isabella will talk in her talk um, a little bit more. And I just uh, wrap up, and this is uh, people in the lab. So Thomas, you know already, Thomas and Isa, and I also, Carlo and Alberto are also working on uh, mechano-related projects. Uh, Thomas and Mathieu are actually working very um, actively on this, all this antenna concept and uh, um, for providing um, much higher um, reduction of the illumination volume in terms of sensitivity, but also in terms of uh, resolution. And in terms of collaborators, this is a very long uh, standing collaboration with Alessandra Cambi from the Netherlands, the group of Hervé Rignon and, and Jürgen Brugger, which is actually making this uh, micro, um, these two dimensional antennas for us. And of course, G2, that we are starting a very nice collaboration within this Human Frontiers program. So that's it. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Oh yes. 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 So, so actually, in the case of the in the case of the GPIs, and actually the results that we got, they came very much along the lines of what what did also. So, in the case of the GPI ancoprotein, what we saw is that we have about 70% of monomers and about 30% of of uh, of a small oligomers, and those small oligomers are essentially between dimers and trimers. So that we could resolve. In the case of the um, cholerarotoxin in particular is more difficult, but it's, it's, it's the problem of the cholerarotoxin, right? Because cholerarotoxin essentially has... In each spot, this is what I'm saying. So in each spot, statistically, those spots are composed, 70% of those spots con correspond to monomer, that is single individual GPI ancoproteins, and 30% of the other spots will be dimers and trimers, and there is a very small percentage of tetramers. No, 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 also. Yeah. 
results that they have got this uplinkly similar to what we had described. Yeah. What they had described two years before. I did it completely different too. Yeah. So, this picture is still... Yes, as well as the separation between these oligomers, right? So, yeah. And, and even the spatial distribution that William Anderson heard using these methods mirrored almost exactly what we It's in the sense of the answer of the, the response of the membrane to the stretch of the censorship. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that on the, um, and, and actually we, we got already some results in which we look at the dynamics of integrins under a, a stretching, right? And so as much as we can, we will use dynamic approaches on living cells, right? But I mean, essentially in the case of the enzyme, which, 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 you know, I mean, it, it, it's going to be very difficult to apply it and to make it to combine it so that we um, stretch and then we looked with ensemble uh, on top just because the, the feedback loop is extremely sensitive. We haven't tried that, right? So that's why we preferred, so in order to do that, go for the, for the other approach. Eh? But, but we, we haven't, it's, it's, it's extremely complicated, these experiments, right? So you have to try it and, and, and uh, yeah. Thank you, that's my idea. Yes. Starting Yes. Yeah. So, and, uh, yeah, please. Yes. So, now you...